show of hands, has anybody here used Google Web Search? <laughs> or Gmail? Or Google Docs? Or, okay, cool. Those things run on top of the system I'm about to describe. Uh, I used to call it the cluster management system that should not be named. Um, but now I can say it's called Borg, as long as I also tell you that that's an internal code name and that we don't actually sell anything called Borg to the outside world to keep the lawyers happy. So other people buy and provision machines. We buy and provision these things, data centers. They come in chunks of a few hundred million dollars a time. And if you count quickly, you can work out roughly how many computers there are in there, so I'm not going to let you do that. What I want to do, though, is to talk about what it's like to make those things useful to people, and that by people I mean our internal developers, the folk that actually deliver the services that you and I get to use as customers. So I searched around for an example of a sophisticated application that would properly demonstrate all of the capabilities and complexities that our existing internal systems offer to our internal developers, and I found Hello World. Uh, there's actually a code lab where you get to try practicing this thing, and it teaches you how to run Hello World. So let me show you what you have to do as a developer in order to be able to run Hello World on that system that I gave you a picture of. Well, first of all, you have to give it a name. It's Hello World, fine. Then you have to say, which of those data centers do you wish to run in? So this one, I happened to pick IC. I actually had to go look it up. It's somewhere in Iowa. I didn't actually know. The last time I ran this, I ran it somewhere in Belgium. I didn't have to know. You just get to pick one of these things. They have two letter names. The second thing you need to say is, here is my program, what I have compiled previously. It's available for you to use. Then you can get to say, if you wish, arguments to the program to say, here's our command line arguments. In this case, we're going to tell it to use a particular port to serve Hello World on, and we're going to let the system decide which port it's going to serve it on, because you might end up with more than one of these things on one machine. And then you can say, if you wish, how much uh, CPU cycles, memory, and disk space it's going to use. Now, this is Hello World. It's not that big. Actually, it's about 50 megabytes. 50 megabytes for Hello World, well, that's because we've got an awful lot of monitoring built into these things. Pretty much every single application inside Google that runs on this infrastructure is a little web server because it provides information about its health, about the performance and statistics of every single RPC call made to it or it makes. And then you get to say, how many copies of this thing do you want running? So replicas in this case. So five seems an entirely reasonable number, so we crank that up and start it. Hold on, why are we doing reasonable? Um, that was optional. Let's find a more interesting number, 10,000. <laughs> so I did this. Um, actually, I was home at the time when I did this. Uh, and then I cranked it up and went, great, it's running. Hold on just a minute, how do I know? So I went to a page which was um, snapshotting the state of my, my job. It's called a job as a set of tasks that are all identical. Uh, the state of my job on this cluster IC. And I just sort of plotted how many of them were running across time. And it took about two and a half minutes to get to 10,000. Now, 10,000 is actually quite a large number. I, some of you probably were queuing outside this morning. So imagine taking about 14 or 15 times as many people as we're trying to get assembled into here and placing all of them in two and a half minutes. That's what happened here. Along the way, we shipped about half a terabyte of binary data, which was the program, and we probably were pulling that at a, a sustained rate of a couple of about, about 20 gigabits per second, probably bottlenecked on the storage server. So actually, my first, the first thing I thought when I looked at this was two and a half minutes, that's slow. I have become jaundiced. Uh, but you could just say this. You could just say, I want 10,000, and it just works. This is why we try and help our developers be productive. They can focus on building the rest of their system rather than that. So let's show a little bit about what happened when we did that. So this is a picture of the internal of the system. Um, the system is called Borg. It has a component called the Borg Master which is, as you might imagine, the master for the cell. Clarification, I use the word cluster to mean a set of machines that are connected with a very high-speed network inside a data center. I use cell to mean a subset of that cluster which are managed by a single Borg master. So typically, there is one large cell in each cluster, but occasionally we fragment them in different ways. So the first thing I'd done was I'd done a compilation. It happens that the way we do compilations is in parallel, sort of in the, the, the external world. So I sort of, I say build, or the equivalent of it, um, you can actually get it now called Bazel. It, uh, th their slogan is correct, fast, pick any two. Uh, it's a wonderful tool, open sourced. Um, so that built my program and shoved it out somewhere into the cloud. And then I gave that configuration file I showed you a moment ago to a command line tool called Borg Config, which transmitted it to the Borg Master. It does an RPC, packages it up as a protobuf, 
And the Borg master, the first thing it does is it, it writes that stuff to a persistent store in case the client crashes or there's a power failure in the cell. And then it says, got it. It doesn't actually done anything yet, it just got it. So this is a pattern which we'll see again in a moment. A couple of milliseconds later, a scheduler fires itself up, looks at the state of the cell, which is stored in that persistent database, and says, hmm, that's odd. John's job is supposed to be running somewhere and it doesn't appear to be running somewhere. Let me see if I can fix that. So what it does is in, in chunks of a few hundred at a time, it finds places for those 10,000 tasks. So it chooses which machines to put them on. And when it's made a decision, it writes those results back to the persistent store in case the scheduler falls over or there is a power outage. And it can just pick up from where it left off and carry on. A few milliseconds later, another component, which we call the link shards, looks at the state of the persistent store and says, hmm, that's odd. Somebody has decided that uh, 100 of these tasks should be running on these 100 machines and that's not happening. Let me go fix that. So you'll see a pattern here, right? Um, so the link shards talk to each of the machines. There has an agent on each one called the Borglet and they communicate to the Borglet and say what's running there and compare that against what should be running there in the persistent store and if they differ, it sends commands down to go fix it. So in this particular case, it says, please start up this hello world task and by the way, you'll find the binary over there. So go grab a copy. Excellent, so here we are running 10,000 copies of Hello World. Stunning success. Um, I could stop here, right? Everything works right. Well, let's look a little more closely. It turns out there's some subtleties here. So I showed you this graph here, and indeed it, it looks like it goes up to 10,000, but if you drill in just a little bit, that line is thick compared to the, the size of 10,000. It never actually got to 10,000 tasks running simultaneously. The biggest I saw over watching it for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes, was uh, 9,993. What? I said 10,000. How could it possibly not have just made 10,000 tasks in the right place? Well, this is why. So this is a graph of how often do things break. Well, by break, I mean uh, a task as is running um, gets evicted or crashes or the machine it's running on dies or some, some bad stuff happens, technical term. So you notice that there's two bars here. The top bar represents the likely fate of what we call production jobs. So think things like Gmail or web search. Those are things we actually care about that the end users can see. And if they're down, they will notice. And those tasks have a pretty good life. So I should just clarification a task here. Think of the Linux process group. Um, um, so those things have a pretty good life. Pretty much the only reason they're gonna get evicted from a machine is because we will upgrade the operating system on that machine to you know, roll out security patches roughly once every month or two, whether it needs it or not. And that causes, uh, as we heard earlier, a reboot, which takes the machine down for a, few, for a couple of minutes. And anything that was running on it has an unfortunate un experience. Um, the other kind of jobs, the non-production jobs, if, if you want to think of the simplest idea here, it, it's batch jobs, sort of MapReduce and things like, like that. You know, it's okay if they get delayed a bit. Um, if some production job needs the resources, we will take it away from the non-production jobs. I mean, there's absolute hierarchy of priorities here. And those experience a much less fun experience. Uh, that gray bar there represents essentially times when a production task will take resources away from a non-production task because it's more important to serve our users than it is to get a particular patch job finished on time. Besides, they can cope with things failing anyway. Uh, they also experience machine outages and a couple of other things as well. So if you do the math here, with 10,000 tasks and an eviction measured in uh, task weeks, we're seeing roughly one task week per minute being executed with those 10,000. I told you 10,000 is a lot. So we were seeing outages which were around about six to 10 tasks not currently running, which is roughly what you expect from the math. Then the other thing I should tell you is that when I ran the jobs, I ran them essentially at lowest possible priority. So anything that sneezed could get the resources away from my tasks. Hello world is not that important in the scale of things. Great, so that graph turns out to underpin almost all of the design discussions we have at Google. When I worked at HP before I joined about six years ago, we were you know, really quite proud about working on uh, scalable storage systems and we cared about petabytes and we were worried about performance. And I get to Google and people say, well, a petabyte is what happens you know, when you get down to a free petabyte, you page somebody because you're about to run out. And the design questions are not how do I make it go, go fast, that's easy, just have more machines. The design questions are wrong around what happens if this fails and then that fails while you're doing an upgrade. So those are where we spend our time. So if you come from a culture which says it is normal for things to fail, it turns out you can make very reliable systems. 
the way I like to phrase this is that Google looks like it's up almost all of the time from the outside because we assume that everything is failing inside all of the time. And we write our software to cope with that. So it's perfectly normal. It's not a problem, assuming you allow this to be happening. So you know, we're quite ruthless about making sure there are no single points of failure. And just to make sure, we like to do exercises every year to say, let's pretend that Mountain View has slid into the sea and can't communicate with the rest of the company. Just let's make sure we can still run it. Let's also pretend while we're doing that, that we're going to take the power down to one of our biggest sites, Atlanta. Can we still keep running? And the fact that you can't tell means that this is working. And we do that every year. We discover interesting things. If you take the power down to Atlanta, what you discover, as we found out the hard way, is that the person on the site doesn't have a big, a big enough credit card limit to pay for the diesel that comes on board. <laughs> now they do. This is why you do these experiments. OK. So the first message I want you to take away from this talk is that worry about keeping things up before you worry about making them more efficient. If they're not up, it doesn't matter how fast they go. But once you've got them up, and you're comfortable they're going to stay up in the face of all the things that are going to be thrown at them, now you can come back and say, well, can I make it a bit more efficient? Now, if you're a small organization, you really shouldn't care. Right? Efficiency is irrelevant by comparison to the cost of people. If you're a big organization, it actually matters. Remember those data centers? They cost a couple of hundred million dollars apiece. So I'm actually part of a group that worries about how do we make things more efficient, modulo the, the availability questions. So this here is a graph of some uh, experimental packing of customer virtual machines into uh, one of our cloud cells. And each line, vertical line here, represents one machine. The top part of the graph talks about how much CPU has been allocated, and the bottom graph talks about how much memory has been allocated. Each of these color bars represents one virtual machine. Uh, so the first thing to notice is, you know, there's a couple of different resources we worry about. We actually have about five different dimensions, but I'll just keep it for two for simplicity. Um, and then the second thing to say is, well, if there's white space in both places, what that means is you have room to add another virtual machine for somebody else. Great. Unless you have too much white space, in which case you are being pessimistic about allocating the workload, in which case you paid too much for the machines on which this is running. More of a problem, though, is if you have white space in one place but not in the other, that means you've basically stranded a resource. You've paid for memory that you can't use because you've burnt up all the CPU on that machine, or vice versa. So those things are really bad. In fact, we looked at this graph and we said, eh, technical term. Eh. So we're working on improving that. We're just about to roll out a thing which gets about 3 to 4% more improvement on the, the resource stranding. So even though this system has been in use for a decade, we're still making it better. It's still worth doing it at this kind of scale. Um, one of the other tricks you saw that on with virtual machines is more than one of them running on a physical machine. We do that internally too. Internally, we don't actually use virtual machines except for things like testing Chrome on Windows. We run on containers, more about that in a moment. And we pack many containers onto one machine. This is a graph of uh, how many we packed onto uh, machines, uh, CDF, from 2013, probably late 2012. Um, since then, the number of cores per machine has gone up, so this number has probably also gone up. Back then, the median size was around about eight to nine tasks per physical machine. That's great. That makes us use the thing more efficiently. We don't have resources just sitting around waiting idle for stuff to do, waiting for another kind of work to do. And the other thing we do is we mix both the production jobs, the front-end user-facing things with low latency requirements, with the back-end batch jobs. And this, this graph turned out to come from a paper about how do you worry about uh, interference effects between those two. But what I want to do is to show you how much efficiency gains we, ha we get from, from being able to, to push those two together. So to answer this question, um, and the Borg paper, which I was mentioned earlier, is in Eurosys, you'll find there are pages and pages of these analyses. I'm just going to show you one of them. Um, when we started this write-up, we sort of said, well, of course it's more efficient to pack production work and non-production work onto the same machines. Great, I said. How much more efficient? What? <laughs> Another technical term. Uh, so we didn't know. We had a you know, policy that it was better. So we went to set out to measure it. The first question you get to ask is, how do you know whether things are, um, how do you compare things, right? You could say, does, I've got a workload, um, and I've put it into this cell, and it fits, great. And then, but then you say, how do I, I put a new algorithm in which will place things differently? Is that better? Well, if, as long as it fits, you can't really tell. So what we did was we invented a way of saying, how few machines could I take a workload and scrunch that workload down, the real life production workload from an actual cell done in simulation, how few machines could I get away with to run that in? We're going to use this as the definition of the, you know, a compacted cell. So here is a graph here of the original cell size. This is the number of machines vertically. And we compacted it to say this is the existing workload that was running on some particular day, uh, Thursday, I think. Um, 
four o'clock in the afternoon or thereabouts, and we just shrunk it down. And we saved sort of 20, 30% for this particular cell. And then we said, great, that was for the combined workload. What happens if we separate the production only workload? Just give that its own cell. The answer is it takes almost as many machines. The majority of our cells are sized based on the size of the production workload. And if you have to pay extra for a different cell to run the batch workload, you're going to spend more money. That ratio we're just going to call overhead. So the, the amount of extra machines you'd have to buy divided by the size of the compacted stuff is just, it's just an overhead. I'm going to present it as a percentage. So that was, that was one particular cell. So we thought it would be more useful to do more of them. Um, I can't actually tell you how many cells we have, and if we were to show that, would that we, I would be not popular back home. Um, what we did instead was we, we, we sampled the set of, of cells we had. This was the most fun sentence to write in the paper. We took all the cells, we sorted them by core count, and we threw away all the small ones, by which I mean 5,000 machines or less. And then we did a random, roughly uniform sampling size across the remaining machines. So we picked 15 cells to look at. So this is a graph of essentially the same overhead calculation we just saw, but presented as a cumulative distribution function across 15. And sort of, again, the median point would sort of in the 25 to 30% range. So we would spend 25 to 30% more money if we ran separate production workload and non-production workload in different cells, which is why we don't. So that answers the question we posed earlier. How much does it help? And one way to look at this is that portion of the picture is just wasted money. If you were to do this policy, you would spend that much extra cash. Clearly a bad idea. So the paper, the bulk paper, if you're interested, has about three, four more of those things. You get much similar kinds of effects from uh, sharing cells between different users, from keeping the cells big rather than small. So we make our cells big partly because we have a couple of workloads that really stress things. For calibration, a medium-sized cell is about 10,000 machines. We have ones which are much bigger. But you don't want to make everything one big cell because that's a place where you get failures. And we want to actually bound the failure domains. We built systems that will propagate operator failures at the speed of light uh, very effectively. One of my colleagues once actually ran a, you know, I, we talked about a time when he was typing a command to say, let's drain the cell, let's take down all the workload in this cell. And he issued the command line, hit enter, and then went to look at the logging to see whether it was happening. Nothing had changed. So he does what you normally do, does the same thing again, repeat. No change. And then he scratches his head for a little while and realized he'd taken down the wrong cell. So you need to worry about failures all the way through the system. Almost all the failures can be traced back to a person doing something that, in retrospect, might not have been the best possible thing. Okay, so let me talk just a little bit more about how do we do that packing. I showed you how do we get sort of basically a quart into a pint pot, sorry, two liters into one and a half liters. So when a, a job comes to us, it comes with what we call a limit, which is a request for these, I, mean, I need this many resources. And it turns out that almost everybody asks for more than they need. Why would they do that? Why would they possibly do that? Well. It helps if I tell you that if they get it wrong and they use more than they ask for, we kill them. So, you know, there is some incentive to, to, to aim high. Um, and to be fair, the people who do the production workload, I mean, they, they want to be able to serve a workload spike. I mean, the example I always use is when Michael Jackson died, there was a workload spike that looked to us like it was a denial of service attack on our web search. We served it, which is a smart thing to do, but the people were scrambling around like crazy trying to understand what happens. To do that, you need some headroom. Now, we actually, it's possible we have sized the headrooms more than it need be, but you know, if Michael Jackson dies again, the spike's gonna be <laughs> stunning. Anyway, so we have these limits, and it turns out most of the time, because we're coping, we're ready to for Michael Jackson, the, the, the actual usage is much lower. And this is fine, right? But we have that headroom just in case we need it. So what we do is we calculate basically a sort of smooth time-varying average of how much resource usage is currently taking place, plus a little bit of padding. And we've, we're gonna say, okay, great. That stuff is most likely to be used over the next 30 seconds to a couple of minutes. Let's make the stuff above that, between what they ask for and what they, we think they're gonna use, available for other jobs, like, I don't know, non-production jobs, like batch jobs, map produce jobs. That essentially is then clawing back resources that have been paid for by one group of people and be, being able to reuse them for other jobs, either by the same people or other groups. You might ask, great, how do we decide what the parameters are for that blue line that wiggles up and down? Well, let me tell you about an experiment we did. So this graph here, uh, again, top is CPU, bottom, uh, the middle one is memory. If you look closely, there's a faint horizontal gray line, which is the actual capacity of the cell, and we overcommit it, right? We, all we allocate more resources than we have, and pretty much we get away with it, because those batch jobs, eh, right? So the bottom dark bar is the actual usage we observe, summed across all of the users in this cell. 
Uh, it would happen to be late November 2013 for this example. And the bit in yellow, the top of the yellow bar is essentially the, the resource estimation, we call it. Um, the size of the yellow is basically the amount of spare padding we put in above the actual usage to give us some safety margin. And we looked at that and we went, eh, too much yellow. Let's be more aggressive. Let's crank down the amount of padding to be very, very close to small. So we ran this again, and great, much less yellow. Now look at the bottom graph. The bottom graph shows basically how often we screw up and make a mistake, out of memory events. If we run out of machine, out of memory on a physical machine, we start killing things from the lowest priority up towards the highest priority ones. Hopefully you get there before you hit any production jobs. And the rate of out of memory events on the normal circumstances is, you know, it's low, it's okay. Uh, with the really aggressive policy, we're seeing many more of them. That's not good, because that is often wasted work, especially if it's a MapReduce job, because they don't always checkpoint things. So we decide, okay, fine, too aggressive. Let's go halfway between the two. Yeah, better, not as much yellow as there is on the left-hand side. And then just to make sure we were still running in a stationary system, we went back to the original settings for the week, for the week four. Um, and this is what you see. So it turns out that what we've decided is week three is those settings are pretty good, and we rolled them out across the whole fleet. So this exercise, which came out as a result of writing this paper, ended up saving us a few percent of resources for running batch jobs. Just for calibration, a few percent means another data center. So the person who came up with this, they earned their keep. Uh, the other thing I use this graph for is to point out with people, you know, this is what real data looks like. So if you go talk to your friends in academia and they're doing nice, smooth graphs, they're not doing it right. right? Tell them to use real data. They'll learn much more from it. I'm going to switch gears now and talk about how do we put this in, in context and, and, and particularly go down the open source path. So what I've shown you basically is talked about some of the properties of, of this part of the world. Uh, it's sort of the, the scheduling system and, the, and how we allocate resources to things. If I put that in context, that represents essentially these four boxes. Remember, each of these things is resilient, fault tolerant, scaled. The larger context has a few more moving parts. This is actually the cluster management ecosystem in which the, my part of the world fits. Uh, the details don't particularly matter, but you know, across the bottom, the, the blue stuff is you know, how do we ship binaries to 10,000 machines in a hurry. The security stuff, I'm told, is incredibly important. I don't understand it, but it's really good. Uh, we worry about people breaking into things. We worry about if you get root access on one machine, can you get root access to the others? No, because we do key distribution and things like that. Uh, and a whole bunch of other stuff. But the point is, most of our users don't have to care. They can focus on writing their application confident that all the other stuff is available for them so they don't have to write it. Besides, you don't want application writers doing security. It's not a good idea. So it turns out the way we do that and make it easy for people is that we give them what are effectively containers. We've been running containers since uh, about a decade ago. We internally, we use uh, LMCTFY and uh, Linux Churroot jails and things like that. Um, but they're basically the same kinds of things that you see now coming along with the Docker containers in that universe. The great thing about these things is you just focus on basically running a Linux process and all of the other stuff. You don't have to bring up an operating system. You don't have to configure your VM to do antivirus patches. It just, all that stuff is done for you by the infrastructure that's our team. So our, our developers focus all entirely at the container level and, and up. Uh, and we have a fair amount of practice doing this. We've been doing this, as I said, for a decade. We, about six months ago, we were launching about two billion of these a week, US billion. So yes, that, that happens a fair amount. So what we thought we'd do is we would share some of the experiences we've gained from doing that with the open source community, because we think it's actually a rather good way to help people be productive. So our approach to this is to crank up an open source uh, Apache 2.0 license written entirely in Go, a project called Kubernetes. Uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, Kubernetes.io, you can also download the store. So Kubernetes turns out to be Greek for the helmsman of a ship. I mean, the reason we're doing this, we're trying to, we think it's a good direction to be steering things in, and we would uh, love to share our experiences with, with the, the community outside. So in putting Kubernetes together, we leveraged a bunch of stuff that seemed to work pretty well inside our internal ex environment. Right? There's some stuff which is directly mimicking what Borg does internally. Some of those are straightforward, like the containers. We switched from Borg containers to Docker containers because they arrived at just the right time with a very nice, tasteful combination of features that allow us to say, oh yes, that's a good way to put things together and to describe just what you need in a world where you don't have to have all that other operating system craft around you. We have, I didn't have time to talk about it, we have the concept of an alloc, which is a set of resources you can put aside and then you run tasks inside it. You want to do that for things like um, uh, a web server, right? A web server is a complicated beast. 
but you also want to make sure you don't ever lose the click-through logs because those turn out to be money. Uh, so we actually write to the web server in two parts. There's the web server itself, and then there's a, a log saver. The web server emits logs to a local disk, and the log saver is a really simple application that runs exactly on the same machine and copies stuff over to a safe place in a distributed storage. So that combination of pairing things together, we use the term alloc, and in the Kubernetes world, it's called a pod. Pod is just a thing which has multiple containers in it, and they're always co-scheduled on the same machine. Useful building lock when you're worrying about how do you actually build distributed systems with large moving parts that coordinate. Um, in Borg, the agent on the machine is called the Borglet, so obviously the one in Kubernetes is the Kubelet. Um, and Kubernetes, just like Borg, has persistent storage, uses etcd. It has the same idea of persistent declarative specifications. I wish it to be so that there are four copies of this running. Make it so. And there's little control loops that will go around and say, there's only three, let's fix that. Or there's five, let's take one away. So that notion increases the makes it much easier to produce high availability systems. And those, those are what I call reconciliation loops. So those ideas were lifted and applied from Borg to Kubernetes. And while we were at it, we thought we would throw away some things that we didn't like about Borg. We've been running it for a while, we have some experiences. Please don't make those mistakes, only new mistakes. So here's some possibilities for new mistakes. The first idea is that we have this notion of Borg of a job. A job is just a set of tasks that are basically identical which is convenient for doing things like rolling updates, but that's about all it's convenient for. It doesn't give you any higher levels of structure. So in Kubernetes, we've gone to a much more flexible model. We can allow you to stick a label, just a key value pair, on pretty much anything in the system. And then you can do a query in order to have sets of things. You say, here's a query which says, I'm looking for things with the following labels. And anything that conforms to that set of, of, of labels is part of the query set. And you say, I wish to do this operation on them. I wish you to monitor them for me, or I wish you to upgrade them, or I wish you to turn them down. Um, so that notion of labels and uh, label queries is much more flexible than the, the simple Borg notion of job. The second thing is we're making explicit in Kubernetes, it's done elsewhere inside the Borg ecosystem, is the notion of hiding how many copies of something there are behind an interface. So in, in Kubernetes, you'll, you'll run a, an application as a set of pods, and what you'll put in front of them is a service abstraction. So the consumers of that service talk to the service abstraction, they, and they have a single IP address to do that with, and they don't know how many pods there are behind the scenes serving the workload. It just gets done for them. And then in Borg, we had pretty much a monolithic uh, Borg master. You know, you could see that the server, that the scheduler was split off, split off, excuse me. Um, so we've taken that same idea and done this, the same thing only much more aggressively in the Kubernetes world. So there's now a bunch of microservices. I talked about replication control earlier, which is keep four copies of something running, or 400. Um, the idea here is that we'll, you know, we'll provide you with basic ones, and if you don't like them, you can write your own. Right? So the same thing, Kubernetes has a scheduler module. If you don't like it, knock yourselves out, produce another one. And because of the way we now have IPs v6, we can have an IP address per pod, Whereas in the Borg world, we actually had to share IP addresses and do port management. That can just disappear. So let me finish up by just summarizing the, the story arc that I've been taking us down here. The first is the most important thing to get right is to have your system stay up. Because otherwise, it can't deliver functionality to anybody. And the only way you're going to be doing that is just relentless attention to everything that could go wrong. It's a wonderful exercise, as was suggested earlier this morning, to actually think antagonistically. How could I bring my system down? When my system is down, what is my fallback to cope with the fact that it isn't up? How am I going to, what is the basic layer over which I'm going to be able to say, maybe I just turn the whole thing off. There is zero service, but I have some fallback I can get to. Understand that, because then at least you have a baseline to which you can go, go back to. But just pay attention to all the things that can go wrong. Postmortems are a wonderful way of doing it. We have an internal postmortem culture, like the one we saw earlier, where it turns out people will, will beg to be added to a postmortem. No, no, I screwed up worse than you did. Because it turns out that's the way you learn how to fix things. Uh, if your culture rewards people for, re for finding out what happened and fixing it, that's going to get things better for much faster than if you penalize people for making mistakes. Everybody makes mistakes. My first check-in broke the Gmail build. I learned some things about rolling stuff back. Um, second thing, efficiency. Once you've got it up, you can worry about trying to make it more efficient. In our universe, it turns out that sharing resources between different users is the key idea about making things efficient in terms of resource allocation. To do that, you have to worry about a lot of second order effects. How do you deal with interference? How do you make sure that you have protection between these people? 
Uh, and then finally, the last message I want to take away, and I hope there's going, there's going to be a talk later which is going to emphasize this, is this notion of containers is actually far more productive for many people than having to do your own operating system management and stuff like that. And so I hope you find it useful, and I hope you'll come and join us in the Kubernetes world to, to make that better for everybody. Thank you.